Hello again. Before I introduce this week's guest, let's talk about this European hedgehog. This footage was taken one month before Britain experienced its highest summer temperatures on record. Here the hedgehog is eating commercially available hedgehog food. And I'm still experimenting with the various different types that are available on the market in terms of their palatability, not to mention their nutritional value. My next guest is Jonathan Marshall, who is a professional animal trainer. He works with specially trained horses and falcons. In the video, he will be talking about the value of bird of prey flight demonstrations for educating tomorrow's bird of prey conservationists and raptor biologists. Please don't forget to watch until the end when he gives advice on how to be a successful animal trainer. I've got the show work, film work, tutorials so I teach people um, but I would say my main bread and butter and the thing that I enjoy most is actually doing shows so I go all around the country um, and actually across different parts of the world Spain Portugal and America as well uh, performing my free spirits show which uh, involves falcons and horses but it's sort of evolved to that point over the last 30 odd years. I left school in 1985. And when I first left school, I was a falconer at a place called Windsor Safari Park, which, and that was my first job as a falconer. Although prior to that, I'd helped out other falconers at uh, country shows and stuff like that. So I had the bug already. But my actual first job in 1985 as a falconer was at Windsor Safari Park. And I was there for a whole summer with a great guy called Bob Haddon, who's still a friend of mine now. Uh, because that was a seasonal job, I went back up to Lancashire, which is where I was from. Did lots and lots of other jobs as well. I was a butcher for a while. I worked for my father, which was a total disaster. Never worked for your dad. Um, I was in the Royal Air Force, which I hated. And then I got a job working at a place called the Hawk Conservancy Trust. And um, then I was a falconer there, doing a lot of outside contract work. So I was doing uh, stately homes and country shows, that sort of thing. Um, then in 1991, I moved to Cornwall and set up my own falconry centre, a place called the Milky Way, which is still in operation today. And I ran that for about 10, maybe 12 years. I uh, had a wonderful time. That was all through my 20s. Um, and then uh, I wanted to kind of move on because when you're doing the same job day after day after day for me personally i didn't feel like i was progressing i had other other avenues i wanted to explore so i was always very creative and musical and into film work and that sort of stuff and i wanted to get more involved in that so i did various film projects i did numerous tv programs and uh documentaries and um as time went by my kind of um uh, reputation as a falconer uh, got well known and I also included horses in my show because from being a child I'd always had horses so I wanted to do something that nobody else was really doing and horseback falconry seemed a very natural progression but I didn't want to just have some kind of scruffy old donkey to do it I wanted to have I thought if I'm going to do it I want it to be brilliant the best anyone's ever seen so I went out to live in Spain and uh, learned how to ride with some fantastic Spanish riders, what are called reconeadores. So they're, they're bullfighting horsemen. I learned with them. I learned how to trick train horses. Uh, I got involved in various films. Um, so I've done stunts in films and stuff like that. Some of the ones that probably you will have heard of was A Knight's Tale. I've done Game of Thrones. Um, lots of things like pop videos and stuff like that. So all the way along, I wasn't really steering the ship. I was going wherever it took me. But I soon found out that I had something that nobody else was doing, and that was horseback falconry with incredible Spanish horses, really good falcons. But because I'm a showman, I decided that I didn't want to just do a show about falconry 
or just about horses. I wanted the theme to take its own path. So about 10 years ago, I started to realize that I was aware of uh, lots of people feeling a bit like I felt that they didn't really fit in to, if you like, the, the sort of um, stereotype uh, type of person who gets a house, gets a mortgage, you know, gets a company car, all the things that you're supposed to do. I thought to myself, well, this is my life. I want to kind of be a bit more of a free thinker than that. I want to make my own path. And so that then started to kind of drip feed into my shows. I started to talk about freedom. And I don't even know where this came from, actually. I don't want to sound weird, but this started to happen to me. I didn't go looking for it, but I started to be very aware of uh, freedom. Maybe it's because I worked with falcons and I was letting the falcons fly. And then in my show, I was doing liberty work with the horses. So I was letting the horses be free in the show. But freedom became uh, a theme in my show, also in my music and very much in my consciousness, in my head. I was thinking about why do we have to conform? Why do we have to be like this? Why do we have to? I mean, all the things that we do, you, me, everybody we know, we're programmed from birth to behave in a certain way. And being an animal trainer, I know that when you train an animal, whether it be a horse or a bird, it's basically programming because you're getting that animal to respond to the things that you've taught it. And then, of course, it responds accordingly because of the, the things it's been exposed to. And I realized that people do exactly the same thing in the last two years because of all the situation that everybody's been through. It's been crystal clear to me how the vast majority of the po population around the world are programmed by a tiny minority who control the rest. And so this has now started to seep into my show. And uh, I've written a couple of books. Uh, and again, that's the underlying message in my show. It's about really being a, a free thinker, uh, working things out for yourself, and actually listening to your, your gut feeling. What's been your biggest guilty pleasure at work? My guilty pleasure in life, and also in my working life has been being attracted to having a great time now and not worrying about tomorrow. Jonathan, you're a professional display falconer, equestrian, author. What has been your proudest moment at work? First of all, I have a love of nature. I have a love of animals, people and life and freedom. In answer to your question, what I am most proud of or most grateful of, we are actually in paradise. We just have to realise it. Are you one of the happiest men in the world? Yes, I would say I'm definitely the luckiest man in the world as well. And the main thing I've got is me freedom, because the one thing that people who want to control us can't control is they can't control what's in here. And it's a, it's a mental space. Once you've released yourself from that, you realize that the world and the possibilities are absolutely endless. You, me, and everybody we know are one aspect of a consciousness. We're all part of the same consciousness. If I die tomorrow, consciousness doesn't die. And I'm just an aspect of consciousness. And so are you. So we're part of everything that's ever been, ever will be, and ever is right now. And that's an amazing thing to realize. When you realize that, you feel so empowered. And that's why I'm the luckiest man in the world. People say to me all the time, you're so lucky. And, and I say, no, it's not luck. It's, it's choice. You make your choices, don't you? Um, my current well-known horse, he's, he's called Amadeus. In fact, I've just I've prepped this. I've just written a book about Amadeus. Amadeus, the story of the black horse. Which people or beatings or books have most influenced your thinking? I met Michael Jackson spent two days with him. I saw him for what he actually was, because inside he was a very scared, frightened, vulnerable child. And he had people around him. I mean, you've never seen anything like it, John. We were down in Exeter. He came to the football club and I was in his vehicle and we got to go through a friend. Uh, but I was totally and utterly, uh, my, my view of him and my view of what he was was completely wrong because he wasn't like that at all and uh, I, I did manage to get to chat to him 
And uh, in fact, my, we, we called, we had a phone conversation a few weeks later. And what was real, weird, really strange about it is he envied me a nobody. And the reason he envied me is because at the time I was flying hang gliders with one of my falcons. And uh, I was telling him about the hang gliding because I thought I'm not going to start talking like about music because he probably gets that all the time. So I was telling him about what I did. He was fascinated by it. And he would have absolutely done anything to be able to just go up to the cliffs at Woolacoon, where I used to go, get in a hang glider and go and fly with an eagle or a falcon like I did. He couldn't do it. Not only could he not do that, he couldn't leave the house, go to the shop, get a newspaper, go to the cafe. He couldn't do anything. And he was an absolute prisoner of his own success because all people wanted was a little piece of him and money and fame and all that rubbish that's, that, that surrounds people who become very, very well known like he did. And I felt really, really sorry for him. It was a very emotional time because I could see that inside there was this very gentle, kind person. It makes me get emotional thinking about it. Who just wanted to really be left alone, but he couldn't be because he was gifted beyond belief. So that had a very profound effect on me, very much so. Funnily enough, the opposite end of the scale, I met another guy called Michael who was a tramp. And uh, he basically looked like he'd never had a bath or a shave in his life, a long beard like that. But he was a very lovely, kind soul, this guy. And he used to write books and he used to give books away to people. Now, his books were quite hard to read because he talked about consciousness, energy, history, time, um, our place in existence. And a lot of it was quite hard going to read. And so he was given the nickname Mad Michael by a lot of the people who lived in the area where he lived. What the people couldn't see was actually he wasn't mad at all. He was a genius, this guy. He had such a deep mind, such an in intelligent, clever mind and such a beautiful way of looking at the world that to other people who weren't on that level of thinking he just seemed weird and mad but actually if you were to sit and, and, and look at what he was really saying he was actually a genius and it really inspired me because i thought to myself you can't change the world the world but you can change your world and in fact if you change your world you've actually changed the world anyway what is your view of display falconry today as a career i feel as though people now are far more sympathetic caring towards animal welfare almost to the point of going too far the other way um so to give you an example when i started to do falconry as a career back in the early 80s nobody would have a problem with a bird being tethered to a perch because it's what we did but now there's a big movement for animal welfare quite rightly so Unfortunately, the people who make the rules on animal welfare often aren't experts. So it's very easy to look at a bird tied to a perch and say, oh, that's cruel. But the alternative to having a bird tied to a perch is to have it in an aviary. And I know because of my experience that if a bird's in an aviary banging around, that is far more harmful to the bird than having it tethered to a perch. They know when they're tethered to a perch, they get used to it. And in actual fact, they're perfectly healthy and kept very, very well, as long as they're flown every day, as mine are. In fact, we'll be going out flying them shortly. But if you have a bird stuck in a cage, a bird doesn't understand that it can't fly through wire. And sometimes if they're not trained properly, they'll repeatedly bang against the wire and they'll injure themselves. So um, it's a very difficult thing because as in every pastime or walk of life, there's people who do things really well and there's people who don't do it very well. The ones who do falconry really well, of which there are a handful, um, they do do it really well because it's an art. It really is an art. Unfortunately, because it's become quite easy to go and get a bird and call yourself a falconer and go and do a show because the regulations aren't very strict. That means that you get people who do it badly and they give the rest of 
us a bad name because their version of what we're doing, they're doing it at a really bad level. But when you know what you're talking about and it becomes an art, it's not just a pastime. It really is an art. What you have to do, John, is you have to develop your bird brain. So you have to think like a bird. Forget thinking like a person. You literally have to develop your bird brain and think like a bird. And once you learn to do that and you realize that they're not people, they're a falcon, then you get inside the head and then you can work out the best way to keep them. But so many people don't have the um ability to do that falconry as a as a as a form of entertainment when it's done well is fabulous when it's done poorly it's actually quite cruel and a lot of people will cringe when i say that but i'm not frightened to say that because ultimately what we should have is the birds welfare paramount in our mind that there is definitely a place for I wouldn't even call it falconry. I'd call it bird of prey displays because what it does do is exactly what it did to me when I was a kid. It infuses young people. It gives them an interest in something that they might never have even thought of before. If you come face to face with a bird of prey for the very first time, it's absolutely awe-inspiring. And that can spark off an interest which could then lead to knowledge, which is the most important thing. And these people are the conservationists of the future, these kids. So that's why I think birds of prey display do play an important part uh, in the public or should be exposed to the public as long as it's done really well. Jonathan, how do you see bird of prey demonstrations changing over the next 10 years? And perhaps if you can offer some insight into what you predict for the future with your combination of birds of prey and horses yeah um i don't even know whether there will be bird of prey demonstrations in the next 10 years and i i'm sorry to say that because i feel as though it's actually already under attack this year they were talking about banning falconry and birds being kept tethered well if you do that it's it, it's going to be almost impossible for the type of display that you see now to take place because you can't take birds of prey and have them in aviaries at country shows or anywhere and expect them to be in good condition because they'll just smash themselves to pieces so i feel as though we are possibly in the very last phase of there being falcon displays we have to teach people that we don't live in beatrix potter land you know and and unfortunately uh, we're all being exposed to this world, which is too, way, way too idealistic. Um, and it, what I mean by that is, you know, people are kind of almost being told to be embarrassed if they eat meat or to be embarrassed about um, leaning towards how nature behaves, survival of the fittest, etc., so but we don't live in a perfect world we live in a world which is flawed and you know it's the fact of life that animals kill each other and eat each other and there's nothing wrong with that that's nature it's been like that forever and it's going to be like that forever you can't start expecting a bird of prey which is a carnivore and is evolved to kill other animals to suddenly become a vegan or a vegetarian it's never going to happen so i think what we need to do is in fact that's one of the topics i talk about in my other book which i plug spirit the fastest bird in the world i deal with that very topic in this book because the animals the birds are actually saying well why would the falcon eat me what have i done wrong well you've not done anything wrong i'm, I'm talking in this in the book here it's a it's a crow or a a, a a duck why would a falcon want to kill and eat me what have i done wrong you've done nothing wrong that is what they eat you know <laughs> Death is as much a part of life as birth. It's nature. It's natural. So I think that the general public have to accept that, unfortunately, in life, some things die. Some things die painfully. And it's terrible. And we'd all love to make, wave a magic wand and everybody live forever. But that's never going to happen. So we have to accept that uh, we, we, we can't steer the world towards this sort of sterile um false reality 
because it's just never going to happen. And the, the, the way we deal with that, where I try to deal with it, is by explaining to children, young people, that actually death and nature and hunting, one animal killing and eating another, is normal. It's been going on forever. And as long as there are wild animals, it will carry on going on. So it's up to us to change our view on it, not us to change the behaviour of others. What career opportunities are there for people wanting to work in bird of prey demonstrations or with birds of prey and possibly combining that with equestrian careers? I would say to any young person looking at what I do and thinking to themselves, I'd like to do something along those lines. Uh, firstly, read everything. Um, try and educate yourself as much as you can from as many different sources as possible. If you get all your knowledge from one source, you're not seeing that, you're only seeing that. So talk to everybody, ask everybody, and also realise that a qualification and a piece of paper that says you have achieved this really doesn't mean an awful lot. I know some people who... I've got names, uh, letters after their name, and you know, on paper, they're geniuses. But I wouldn't give them a job because it's all theory. And the one thing you cannot teach people, well, there's two things. You can't teach experience, number one, and you can't teach common sense. Common sense is far more valuable, uh, both to an employer and also to someone who is self-employed. I've got quite a lot of common sense. And I learned my common sense through experience, life experience. And you have to take responsibility. If you are somebody going into this sort of professional, this line of work, well, learn as much as you can, get as much experience as you can, try and surround yourself by the very, very best people that you can. And the main thing is, is never say no. If someone says to you, no, uh, well, you're not doing that, or we don't want you for that, just go, okay, fine. Never, ever accept no for an answer. If you know something's right and you want to do something and you think you can do it, just let me do it. What's the worst that can happen? The worst thing that can happen is it doesn't work and you end up looking silly. And you know what? I've looked silly a million times. Anybody who wishes to get involved in the kind of work that I do, the main thing to remember is you don't become a falconer or a horseback showman because you want to be a millionaire. That's not the answer. You do it because you love it. If I wanted to be a millionaire, I'd be selling petrol. What you have to do is do this job because you love it. You love your animals and you love what you do. And the thing is, you've already won the lottery if you've got that frame of mind. I, I always say this when, when people say to me, well, how do you make a living doing a falcon? How do you make a living doing? Well, what do you need in life? You need to pay your bills, feed yourself, shelter. You don't need millions. You just need the basics to get along. And if you're happy doing your job and you can make ends meet, then actually you're, you're a millionaire. What are the skills, experiences and personal qualities that have been key to your success? If you're going to be successful, basically as a showman, you have to, people have to like you. If they don't like you, straight away, you're onto a loser. But you just have to be an honest, decent person that people like. You have to have the right kind of personality. You have to have enthusiasm. You, you also have to, especially with animals, your animals have got to be in good condition and be in control. Be calm. What advice can you offer somebody wanting to follow in your footsteps, work with horses, doing bird of prey demonstrations? And being an author. Do it with absolutely every ounce of passion and fibre that you've got in your body. Jonathan, is there anything that you'd like to add? To every single person who listens to anything that I am telling you right now, I want you to know that I mean every single word from the bottom of my heart. I wish and hope that everybody listening and everybody who might listen to this in the future has a brilliant, brilliant life and makes the very most of every single second that we've got. 
because you never know when you're not going to have any more seconds. Any single one of us could be snuffed out just like that. So I wish everybody to have the same awareness, connection to their own consciousness and lack of fear that I somehow or other have got. And I don't know even where it came from, but I can tell you now there is nothing in this world that frightens me more than having my freedom taken away. But even that doesn't frighten me that much because they can never take away my freedom of thought. If In your mind, if you know that where you are and how you feel about who you are and your awareness to consciousness, if that's intact, there is nothing to be scared of and you can do anything. So go and do it. Jonathan, that was absolutely inspirational, unique, philosophical. Thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel. Jonathan Marshall. My pleasure.